My name is Shamila. I am a security researcher at DreamLab Technologies and also a 3D printing enthusiast. And today we are going to talk about bypassing biometric systems with and without the help of 3D printing technologies. Humans have used features such as face, voice and gait for thousands of years to recognize each other. But only recently, humans start using biometric-based systems to authenticate individuals. Biometrics is the science of establishing or determining an identity based on the physical or behavioral traits of an individual, such as the one as we can see here in the slide, fingerprints, DNA, signature, iris, face, voice, gait, vein pattern, ear shape, keystroke dynamics, and more. Biometric systems are essentially pattern recognition systems that read as input biometric data, extract the feature set from such data, and finally compare it with the template set stored in the database. If the extracted feature set from the given input is closed to a template set stored in the database, then the user is granted access. But biometric systems are prone to different attacks. Direct attacks, presentation or spoofing attacks are performed at the sensor level. The sensor is full and not replaced nor tampered. Indirect attacks are performed inside the biometric system by, for example, bypassing or overriding the capture device, the signal processor, the comparator or the decision engine, manipulating the data in the biometric reference database, or exploiting possibly weak points in the communication channels between the different components. But during this talk, we are going to focus on this, on presentation attacks, this part of the system. Now, we are going to see presentation attacks in reality. These are real cases of criminals using silicon masks to fool security cameras, airport security, and facial recognition systems. The first one is a suspect in the robbery of a North Carolina bank. This one robbed four banks and a CVS pharmacy with a silicon mask from an online site. I think the model of the mask name is the player. Um, from SPFX Mask is, is a site that now is closed, but it used to sell um, this type of realistic masks. The third one is a suspect accused, accused of robbery and several other crimes committed using a generic mask made by another online site. The name of the, this model, of this mask model, is the neighbor. And the last one, is a passenger who boarded the plane in Hong Kong as an old man in flat cap, but arrived in Canada as a young man. Regarding fingerprint biometric systems, this first case is a Brazilian doctor who faced charge, charges of fraud after being caught on camera using silicone fingers to sign in for work for absent colleagues. The second case is a gang involved in the illegal preparation, this is the image, <laughs> the illegal preparation and selling of clone fingerprints to full biometric attendance systems of several educational institutions. The last case was in my country, Argentina. Six employees of the local airline were fired after discovering that they falsified, falsified their entry to work with silicone fingers, taking turns to attend. But on weekends, when the payment is double, all six attended to work. But how 3D printing could help bypass biometric systems? In this first case, researchers from Forbes 
full Android facial recognition systems with a 3D printed head. In this second case, the MSU Michigan State University team created a fake finger by printing, by 3D printing a mold. And in this last case, a group of researchers from PICAD demonstrated that it was possible to bypass the face recognition login mechanism of the iPhone X using a cheap 3D printed mask made from a stone powder. I love 3D printing. I have two 3D printers at home. Why not make my own experiments for bypassing biometric systems? But first, I wanted to try the traditional methods for attacking biometric systems to better understand how 3D printing technology could help make these attacks faster and better. But first, we need to know how is the fingerprint recognition process. Most fingerprint scanners compare distinctive features of the fingerprint, generally known as minutia. Typically, investigators concentrate on points where ridge lines end or where one ridge splits into two, called bifurcations. Collectively, these and other distinctive features, such as you can see here, delta, a short ridge, a spur, the bifurcation, ridge enclosure, a crossover or ridge, an island, all these features together are called typical. The scanner uses complex algorithms to recognize and analyze these distinctive features. The basic idea is to measure the relative positions of the features in the same sort of way you might recognize a part of the sky, the sky by the relative position of the stars. But to get a match, the scanner doesn't have to find the entire pattern of distinctive features, both in the sample and in the print from the biometric database. It simply has to find a sufficient number of features and patterns that the two prints have in common. There are many fingerprint sensors on the market. These are optical sensors. You can recognize it, them for, for the light. In general, they use light. These are capacitive sensors. And the last one is an ultrasonic sensor. Optical fingerprint sensors are the oldest method of capturing and comparing fingerprints. This technique relies on capturing an optical image and using algorithms to detect unique patterns on the surface by analyzing the lightest and darkest areas of the image. Capacitive fingerprint scanners, instead of creating a traditional image of a fingerprint, they use the body natural capacitance to read the fingerprints. Because the charge stored in the capacitor will be changed slightly when a finger ridge here is placed over the conductive plate, while an air gap or a finger valley will leave the charge at the capacitor relatively unchanged. These changes can then be recorded and analyzed to look for distinctive and unique fingerprint attributes. The latest fingerprint scanning technology is the ultrasonic sensor. To capture the details of a fingerprint, the hardware consists on both an ultrasonic transmitter and a receiver. An ultrasonic pulse is transmitted against the finger that is placed over the scanner. Some of this pulse is absorbed and some of it is bounced back to the sensor, depending upon the unique details of each fingerprint. The sensor then calculates the intensity of the returning ultrasonic pulse at different points, resulting 
in a very detailed reproduction of the scanned finger. Now, for our test, the devices to be tested are four. Two biometric attendance systems with optical sensors and two mobile phones, one with a capacitive sensor and the other one with an ultrasonic sensor. This is the first photo of the materials bought for the experiments and includes a lot of materials, <laughs> alginate, a whole glue can, gelatin powder, gummy bears, candle wax, transparent tape, play-doh, instant glue, epoxy parry, UV resin, silicone fingertips, fingerprint ink, and more. But during the test, I realized that I missed important materials like, for example, silicone, liquid latex, wood glue, and so much more, and the list grew, and grew a lot. The first attack to test was the grease attack. For grease attacks, you need to have a clear grease stain left on the surface of the fingerprint scanner. But this stain must have most of the important features of the fingerprint left on the pad, so that the scanner can reliably read the same line ends and curves that it detected on the previous user. The idea of the attack is to gently press different materials such as gummy bears, play-doh, silicone fingertips and latex gloves against the fingerprint scanner, but with care, with careful, <laughs> without ruining the stain. Here are the results of the grease attacks. With gummy bears, play-doh, latex glove and silicone fingers, the scanner detected a finger, but the fingerprint was not clear enough to fool the sensor. So this attack was unsuccessful on all the tested devices. But for me, this test, this test was not a failure because the gummy bears were really yummy <laughs> and kept me fed during the rest of the experiments. So no failure for me. The problem with grease attacks is that in most cases, a regular grease stain on the scanner surface is not enough to fool the sensor. We need to enhance it with other substances to obtain better results impersonating legitimate users. But these, substance, these substances must be transparent so that the user does not, not notice them. And also with ointment consistency to better enhance the fingerprint stain. This substance could be spread in the legitimate user fingerprint or in the fingerprint sensor. Using petrolatum ointment, paraffin or cocoa butter lip balm, we successfully fooled the sensors and were able to authenticate ourselves as the last user of the device in optical and in capacitive scanners. Now we are going to see a demo. In this case, um, we are using cocoa butter lip balm. We are spreading the lip balm in the legitimate user fingerprint. We can see the enhanced grease stain in the fingerprint scanner. And then another user wearing a latex glove can be authenticated as the last legitimate user of the device. Now for consensual attacks. The term consensual suggests that the user we are taking the fingerprint from is aware of the process and participates by pressing his or her finger into some kind of a mold. For molds, we use these materials, alginate, epoxy parry, play-doh, hot glue, and candle wax. And for casting, we use silicone, homemade ballistic gelatin, liquid latex, synthetic resin, and bush glue.
you can see here here you can see here that the hot glue mold of course is the researchers fingerprint are blurred but in this part you can see that the hot glue mold is really as it's very detailed so it's a really good mold for the molds we obtain the best results with alginate and hot glue and for casting we obtain the best results using liquid latex hot glue and silicone with the combination of a hot glue mold and liquid latex or wood glue casting, we were able to pull all the sensors. The same with the combination of an alginate mold and liquid latex casting. You can see here that the ballistic gelatin test didn't work. That's because ballistic gelatin is not so easy to make at home. We tried several combinations of gelatin powder, water and glycerin but the results were not enough to fool the scanners. Also, note that the working fingerprints are very thin. And please be careful if you plan to make hot glue molds. Let the glue cool down a bit and test the temperature under the foil and dip your finger in water because uh, before, sorry, before pressing it against the hot glue. Trust me, the heated glue can reach over 200 degrees. I've been there and it burns, and it burns a lot. For unconsensual attacks, in these attacks, the user does not participate actively, and latent fingerprints are obtained in a non-cooperative way. Assuming we have identified the correct latent fingerprint, we need to follow the following procedure. This procedure here. So we are going to need to enhance the latent fingerprint with glue fumes or fingerprint powder, lift the latent fingerprint with a digital camera or transparent tape, digitally enhance the fingerprints with software, create a mold, and cast artificial fingers with silicone, liquid latex, or wood glue. The first option to enhance the latent fingerprint is dusting with fingerprint powder and a brush. The second option is encapsulating the latent print inside a container with instant glue. Fumes from the glue will be attached to the wrist of the latent fingerprint, making possible to lift it. In this case, we obtain the best results, lifting the latent fingerprints with a digital camera using a fingerprint enhancement software in Python to digitally enhance the fingerprint image offset printing a transparency using the transparency as a mold and casting it with liquid latex. With this procedure, we were able to fool the optical sensors. The fingerprint ink on a latex globe techniques also worked on capacitive and ultrasonic sensors. You can see here that the offset plate technique didn't work, but it did not work because it, the offset plate was covered with some kind of rubber that is generally used in this type of plate and the rubber interfered with the creation of the mold. But without the rubber, I think it's a technique that could work. For unconsensual attacks with 3D printing, we need an UV resin SLA 3D printer, software to digitally enhance the latent fingerprint, 
a 3D CAD design tool, like for example Tinkercad, and a latent fingerprint in glass or a fingerprint ink in paper. In this case, we can use FDM or filament 3D printers for these attacks because we need the precision of an UV resin printer. To obtain a working fingerprint through 3D printing, we need to follow these steps. First, we need to lift the latent fingerprint with a digital camera with macro functionality. Then, we need to use fingerprint enhancement software. In this case, I use a software in Python, but you can use a, any kind of graphic software for this task. Then, we need to import the enhanced image of the fingerprint into Tinkercad and configure the dimensions and add the reach height to create the 3D model. One negative or hollow for casting and one positive for direct tests. Then we need to print the models on the 3D printer. In this case, it's the Anycubic Photon uh, 3D printer with UV resin and then we need to use isopropyl alcohol and UV post-curing lamp or direct sunlight to complete the final curing process. At the end, we need to cast the molds with wood glue or liquid latex. It took us 10 retries to achieve the optimal printer settings and reach height, but the most important step of this procedure is this one is the step four. Is the, if the step four is okay, the fake fingerprints will work in the different sensors and, and scanners. So it's, it's really important to configure the fingerprint length, height, and the reach height in a correct way. The results. The fingerprint obtained from the 3D mold with liquid latex or wood glue casting worked on all sensors. And the positive fingerprint print directly on UV resin worked on the ultrasonic sensor and in one on, of the optical sensors. In the optical sensor, we had to spread the fingerprint with cocoa butter lip balm or petrolatum for the sensor to recognize it as a finger. And here you can see a summary of all the process. Here is the fingerprint enhancement, the models in Tinkercad, the printing models, and the casting with wood glue and liquid latex. And then at the end, we are using the fake fingerprints to authenticate in an optical scan. Now we are going to see the demo of this attack. Here we have the fake fingerprint and we are using it to authenticate ourselves, ourselves in a Samsung S10 phone with an ultrasonic sensor. In this case, we use a, as a mold the 3D printing mold that we were talking before. And for casting, we use liquid latex. In this case, we use liquid latex with a, a skin color, but it's not necessary. You can use any color of latex and, and it will work. For biometric face recognition, biometric face recognition is the process and ability to identify the face of an individual, either to grant access to a system or to find out the details of a person by matching the face with the data in the biometric database. What a biometric face reader does is map and extract the 
distinct in features, for example, these points and these points here. Features of a person face that can be used for recognition and stores the data in the biometric database along with the identity of the individual. Our next step in this research is to perform presentation attacks in face recognition systems by using 3D printed masks and heads to fool the different scanners. Now we are working on that and it's really fun. We publish a paper of this research that you can download for more details. Another interesting research was made by Paul Rascaniers from Talos. We met in Switzerland when we wrote, we are researching about using 3D printers to create fake fingerprints. He used the same 3D printer for the test, but different software. Also, he tested different devices. So if you are interested, interested in this subject, it is worth to check it out too. It's the first link of the reference materials. Also, I add other reference materials in case some of the topics discussed in this talk are of interest and you want to know them a little more. Thank you. It was an honor to present this talk at DEF CON. Uh, and I'll also thanks to my co-workers and friends that helped me with this research, especially Las Pivas de Infosec, that are th they are always there for me. So stay safe, everyone.